I want to turn over to John chapter 14 tonight, and I'm going to share with you just a small portion of a teaching. About 30 years ago, I came out with a teaching that I called the Christian Survival Kit. And um, I haven't taught on this very often because it's, there's 16 teachings in it. And so I don't ever hold a meeting that's 16 sessions long. And on television, uh, I usually go one week on one teaching. So to go 16 weeks on one subject, most people lose interest. So I don't teach on this very often. But this is one of the most important things that God showed me. And uh, if you watch that story about Gina Boop this morning, uh, one of the things that Bud said was that he had, he had heard me say that your first reaction pretty much dictates the, way, the outcome of things. And I got that from right here. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. John 14, 15, and 16 are all a message that he ministered to his disciples after the Lord's Supper before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed. And so it was just hours before he was going to be arrested and before he would be crucified the next day. And he was saying these things to prepare his disciples. Matter of fact, in the 16th chapter, in verse 1, he said, uh, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might, or excuse me, I think that's in the 14th chapter. Let me read this. In verse chapter 16, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. So he spoke these things to prepare them for this crisis situation that they were going to be going through. And then the last verse of the 16th chapter, the last thing that's recorded here, it says, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, like in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Remember the context of this. This is the night before he's crucified. And he's telling them, be of good cheer. Let not your heart be troubled. This is back to chapter 14, verse 1. So here's how he spoke to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. They were going to see him arrested. And of course, not only would Jesus' life be in jeopardy, but all of the people who followed Jesus were also going to be in the crosshairs and they were going to be coming after them. And so these guys were afraid. And it says that not only did Peter, but all of the disciples forsook him and fled. And so these guys were scared. And how is Jesus preparing them for this? Look at this. In verse 1, John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Did you know that today, if I wasn't reading this from Scripture, if we weren't here at this conference, if I hadn't have introduced this the way that I had, if I was just with you when the doctor says you're going to die, or whatever the crisis is that you're going through. And if I walked up and said, don't let your heart be troubled, I guarantee you the vast majority of Christianity would condemn me yeah. and say, you aren't being sensitive. Right. You are asking people to do things that are wrong. And people today embrace their weaknesses. Not in the sense that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God, I'm going to crush, trust you. But they embrace their weaknesses and take glory in all of these kind of things and feel like, well, God, I'm only human. And we use this as an excuse for weakness. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. I've been born again and I have the Spirit of God living on the inside of me. These guys didn't even have the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus is telling them, don't let your heart be troubled. By saying it the way he did, he's saying you have the ability to keep your heart from being troubled. And did you know, again, most Christians don't believe this. Most Christians, you've heard me say this a lot, but most Christians fall apart like a $2 suitcase when trouble hit, knocks on their door and they embrace this. They let their emotions go wild. They vent and throw out all of their unbelief, speak all of this stuff. And then after they've just, you know, spiritually thrown up all over themselves and covered in all of their unbelief, then they go to God and, oh God, I'm going to trust you and believe you. But, I, but the very first thing you have to do, the first thing that Jesus told his disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. Amen. 
You do not let your heart be troubled. You have the ability to control your reactions. You know, I've got a teaching entitled Harnessing Your Emotions. And on the cover of it is a picture. It's a drawing of a guy riding a horse, but the horse is totally out of control. The saddle came loose. The saddle swung around on the underside of the horse. He's holding on around the horse's neck for dear life. The horse is totally out of control. And it says, harnessing your emotions. And the reason I use that is because I've had horses most of my life. And, you know, I've learned about horses that if you let a horse get away from you and get into a run, you just might as well jump off. Unless you really know what you're doing, there's not much that you can do to turn a 1,200-pound, a 2,000-pound horse around and stop them. It is easy to stop a horse from getting out of control, but once you let it get out of control, you're in big trouble. My horses were always green broke because I didn't have time to read them, ride them very much and I didn't have much time to work with them and so they were, they were just half broke. And I remember a little seven-year-old boy came out and I just taught him a few things. What the Bible says, you put a bit in a horse's mouth. A horse can't do anything without its mouth. You know, if, if the horse wants to rear up, it can't rear up unless it throws its head back. So what you do is put a tie down on it, keep it from throwing its head back, and it will never rear up on you. If a horse wants to get down and roll and try and get you off, all you got to do is watch it. And if it starts to put its head down, yank that bit up and keep its head up, and a horse will never get down and roll on you. A horse can't run that direction with its head turned this direction. So it can't do it. I actually held a horse, a 1,200-pound horse, down on the ground one time with my foot on his head. A 1,200-pound horse. There's no way that physically I could do it except a horse has to throw its head up before it can get up. And you hold its foot, you put it, your foot on its head and hold its head down, it can't get up. You can control a 1,200-pound horse. This is all what James chapter 3 says. You put a bit in a horse's mouth and you control their whole body. So I taught this little kid that. He rode that horse for an hour and a half and the horse misbehaved some, but he just did what I told him, and there was not a single problem. As soon as he got off, there was another guy that came with his son, and his son was 22 years old, and he had just been married, and he was going to show his wife <laughs> that he could ride. And I started to tell him the same stuff. Oh, I can handle it. Within five minutes, he was on his way to the hospital. <laughs> the same horse that had been ridden for an hour and a half by a seven-year-old, a 22-year-old couldn't handle it because he was uh, showing off and, and let the horse get away. I the reason I bring that up is to say that if you will control a horse and the moment they start to do something, you deal with it, it's fine. But if you let a horse get away with stuff, you're in big trouble. Yeah. Now, that may not relate to everybody, but to any of you that have ever had horses and stuff, that's true. And it's true of a lot of things. You know, when our son died... We got a call at 4.15 in the morning. Told us that our son was dead. And uh, Jamie and I, because of this exact teaching, this is the exact words of Jesus that came to me, let not your heart be troubled. And most people would say, well, that's wrong. You would be in denial. You're in denial if you don't indulge. You just aren't being honest. No, you're being carnal is what you are when you go by how you feel. I'm not denying that I had all kinds of feelings come at me, but I am denying that all I am is a physical human being and I have to respond in grief and sorrow if something bad happens. I've got a spirit on the inside of me and the fruit of that spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And it's producing that 100% of the time. And I don't care if I get news that somebody has died. I don't care if I get news that I'm going to die. I don't care what the, what the world has to say. Jesus telling his disciples the night before his crucifixion, if there was ever a justification for people being upset, it should have been the disciples of Jesus. Matter of fact, many people would have argued and said, well, you didn't really love him if you, if you could just keep from being troubled. When you see him arrested, when you see him beaten, when you see him crucified, something would have been wrong with them if they didn't just, you know, weren't, weren't heartbroken. And yet Jesus gave them a command, let not your heart be troubled. I wish I had time to preach all of this to you. 
There's another verse over in here. Look in the 14th chapter. I'm going to come back, but look in John chapter 14 and in verse, um, verse 28. You have heard that I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father for my Father is greater than I. Now again, remember the context. He had already told them, I'm leaving. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. And he had told them, and they said, no, we don't know where you're going. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he had been explaining all this to them. So now he comes back to it and he says, I've told you that I'm leaving and I'm going to the Father. If you loved me, you would rejoice. This is a radical statement. You need to put your spiritual seatbelt on. This will just rock some of you. But you know why they grieved, why they were afraid, why they ran? Because they loved themselves more than they loved Jesus. If they loved Jesus, even though they didn't understand the total plan of salvation and they didn't understand that he was going to die and rise from the dead, if anybody ever pleased the Father and if anybody ever walked with God, if anybody was ever going to go into the presence of God after death, it would have been Jesus. And if they loved him more than they loved themselves, they would have even rejoiced because he constantly was saying that, man, I love my father. I only do what I see my father do. He would, he would minister all day long and be totally tired. And yet he would spend all night long in prayer with his father. Man, Jesus loved his father. He longed to be with his father. And if they would have loved him more than they loved themselves, they would have actually found reason to rejoice at the crucifixion of Jesus before he was resurrected. Even if they didn't understand he was going to be raised from the dead, they would have said at least he's with his father and they could have rejoiced. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but the reason that we are so distressed and so, so disheartened and depressed and all of these other things are because we love ourselves so much. If we loved God, you could actually get to a place where you're so excited about seeing him that, man, if you die, awesome. And if you don't die, it's, you're going to be able to rub the devil's nose in this and give a testimony. And so you're just, you're just pleased, whichever way it goes. You don't let your heart be troubled. You know, when your heart is troubled, again, I'm saying this in love, it's because we're operating in fear because we're so fearful about ourselves. We aren't understanding the love that God has for us. We don't understand the great things that he's got prepared for us. The apostle Paul, see, he was in a relationship with God where he says, I'm in a great strait between two choices. One is to go be with the father, which is far better for me. That's what I really want to do. But I know that I have to stay here for your benefit. He was ready to go. Man, when they came to Paul and said, if you don't quit preaching the gospel, we're going to kill you. He'd just reach up and kiss him on the forehead. <laughs> say, awesome. So they'd say, well, then we'll put you in jail. And he says, fine, I'll just praise God. And they have an earthquake and get everybody in the jail set. So they say, well, man, get out of here. So he says, okay. And he goes back to the marketplaces and preach the gospel. How do you intimidate a person that's not afraid to die? You know, when I was in Vietnam, it was right after I'd had this experience with the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968, I got drafted in June of 69 and by uh, January of 70, I was in Vietnam and I was just so in love with God that man, I was just having an awesome time. It, it, it's hard for me to explain. I was praying that God would kill me, but it wasn't because I was miserable and it wasn't because Vietnam was bad. It was because I was so in love with God. I just wanted to go be with Jesus so bad that I honestly was asking God to kill me. And I remember one time I was, I was a chaplain's assistant and we got sent out to a place. This place wasn't any bigger than this room right here. And in a two hour period of time, we took a hundred and something mortar hits inside of that perimeter. And you could see the muzzle fire from the Vietnamese coming up the hill. 
and it looked like we were going to be overrun. And a matter of fact, they were overrun. I was a chaplain's assistant and they got us out. They got the chaplain and me out right before the hill was overrun and nearly every person on that hill was killed. It was a life and death situation. And I remember what was going on. I had my M16 pointed down the hill. I never had to fire it because they were out of range, but I could see the muzzle fire from their weapons. And you know what I was doing? I was just praying and saying, oh, Jesus, I could be with you before the night is up. I was so excited. I was just thinking, this is awesome. Awesome. And I was just so happy. I was thinking, oh, thank you, Father. And I was so blessed. And then I got to thinking about the Vietnamese that I had my gun pointed at. And I started saying, but God, they don't know you. And I was interceding and praying for these guys that I was about to shoot. And I just had love flowing through me and I was so excited. And I know some of you think I'm weird. Well, I think you're weird. (laughs) Paul says for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm in a straight between two. You know, you can get to where you love God more than you love yourself and it's not about you. And one of the benefits of this is that when you get that place, Satan can only use selfishness. Fear has no place if you don't love yourself so much. You know, in uh, Revelation chapter 12, I was just studying this this week, and it says that, you know, the dragon, the old serpent, the devil, was cast down to the earth, and he had great wrath because he knew that he had a short time. And the people, the believers on the earth, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Yeah, Did you know for you to overcome, you got to get to where you don't love your life so much. The reason some of you are just so heartbroken because you got a sickness and you could die is because you love yourself so much. You need to get over yourself. I don't know how to say this any differently. It's just, (laughs) you know what? If you had, if you were dead to yourself, you could take a corpse and put it here in front of us and you could spit on the corpse. You could kick the corpse. You could insult the corpse. You could ignore the corpse. And if it's a corpse, it won't respond. (laughs) You know why you respond? Why you are just so heartbroken? It's because you aren't dead to yourself. It's because you haven't cast your care over on the Lord. We have fallen under the spell of our society that is just all about self. Everything is about you. And we have adopted this and we are just out to promote self. And when self suffers, man, you just can't handle it. You know, I was just in Norway and uh, there was a man, Dennis Greenwich, and he's a pastor in London. I'd never met him before. And I was the main speaker. I think I spoke four times. Dennis spoke the first time and the last time. I'd never met this man before. He was an African-American pastor in London. And he got up and he says, I've never met Andrew. I've never heard his teaching. But as I prayed about this, God told me my assignment was to just prime the pump. I am here to get you opened up to what this man has to say. And he spent his whole hour telling people to expect, open up your heart. God is going to speak through this man. And I'd never meant Denny's, but you know what? I said, this man loves God more than he loves himself. In my 50 years, I have never had anybody get up and do something like that. And so, man, that drew me to him. And we got to visit with him and he's just an awesome guy. It was great. But did you know there's very few people that would put the kingdom of God above themselves? And because of that, that's the reason that when something happens to self, you just are hurt so badly and you can't get over it. I'm telling you, your emotions, if you ever let your emotions get out of control, it's hard to rein them back in. Matter of fact, are you still in John chapter 14? Look over here in James chapter one. Let me show you this. I'm going to come back maybe. In James chapter one, 
in verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin and sin when it is finished brings forth death. This says that sin has to be conceived. Sin doesn't come upon you like a seizure. It has to be conceived. This is talking about birth. You know, I'm not going to teach on how a baby comes. Hopefully everybody here knows this. I'm going to take some things for granted. But babies aren't brought by the stork. You don't just get pregnant without having a physical relationship with a man. You have to be impregnated. You have to conceive a child. This says sin has to be conceived. And where is it conceived? In your lust. We use the word lust nearly exclusively to describe immoral sexual desire. But the word lust, if you look it up in the way it was used in the King James, matter of fact, over in Galatians chapter 5, it says the spirit lust against the flesh and the flesh lust against the spirit. The spirit, the Holy Spirit does not have an immoral, ungodly sexual drive or desire. The word lust isn't used the way that we use it today. It's just talking about strong emotion. Sin is conceived in your emotions. Amen. That's good. There are people that do not want to sin, and yet they allow, in a sense, intercourse with the devil through their emotions. When you sit there and allow fear in, and I could name a dozen things right here, but going back to John chapter 14, verse 1, when you let your heart be troubled, when sickness comes and you begin to panic and, oh no, what am I going to do? And you get fearful about all of these things. You have allowed Satan to plant a seed in your life that you don't want to come to fruition but you indulge it. Most people allow their emotions just to go the full gamut and only after they've cried all they can cry, after they have worried all they can worry, they turn to the Lord, oh God, help me. By that time, you've got to have an abortion. You've already got this thing in process. It's in the birth canal and you're gonna have to have an abortion. And I tell you, that's not the way to deal with things. The way to do it is not to conceive it. If you can control your emotions, you can stop sin. And I'm not only talking about sin, but you can stop sickness from having a hold on you. You know, I started telling this story about when we got the call about my son being dead and immediately we had these feelings of grief, sorrow, anything that anybody else would have. But this exact verse, the Lord spoke to me, let not your heart be troubled. If you let your emotions go, if you let yourself get into unbelief, it's going to be hard, hard, hard to overcome this. And so Jamie and I immediately agreed. We immediately spoke our faith and we had enough wisdom from the word of God to know that death and life is in the power of the tongue. So we weren't going to speak something contrary to what we believe. So we didn't say anything for a long time. I mean, we went, we got dressed, we had to get up and get dressed and head into Colorado Springs. It was an hour and 15 minutes, didn't have cell phones in 2001. And so uh, we didn't know what had gone on. And finally, I just, I was feeling so much grief and sorrow and things come against me that I just said, I am not gonna let this happen. I am not gonna grieve even over the death of my son. And I started praising God. And I started saying, Father, you did not kill my son. Amen. You didn't do this. I'm not blaming you. You're a good God. And I just started praising him and saying, Father, thank you. And whether our son comes back to life or not, I am going to serve you with everything I've got. I just started praising God. And you know, it's like priming the pump. Yeah. When you start praising God, maybe I didn't feel like it then, but when I started just encouraging myself in the Lord, again, go back to that chapter 16, verse 33, in the world you shall have tribulation. He didn't say do this only when everything's going good. But when you're in the midst of tribulation, when everything is bad in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Not just when things are good. When you're in the midst of tribulation, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. 
And I just started praising God. And within just a few moments, man, all of a sudden, God brought prophecies back to my remembrance. Faith welled up and I started laughing. Not by faith, but by feeling. Mm -hmm. And I started saying, this is going to be awesome. Our son's coming back from the dead. He had been dead for nearly five hours. Between four and five hours, he had been stripped naked, uh, put in a freezer in a morgue with a toe tag on, and he just sat up and started talking. It was awesome. And after being dead without oxygen for over four hours, there was no brain damage, no more than he had before. And today he's alive and well, and we've got a granddaughter that just turned 16 years old and life is good and it, it, good things are happening. And you know why? Because we grabbed hold of our emotions and did not let our heart be troubled. Some of us are saying, how can you do that? The rest of the verse, you believe in God, believe also in me. You know how you let not your heart be troubled? Faith. Believe God. Well, I don't feel like believing God. <laughs> Faith isn't a feeling. Amen, that's right. Come on. Faith can involve feelings. Sometimes you have feelings, but did you know actually you are operating in some of your strongest faith when you don't feel anything. That's good. That's good. That's good. When I saw my son raised from the dead, I wasn't feeling faith. Right. I did it because it was the right thing to do. Did you know some of the biggest failures I've ever had is when I felt awesome <laughs> because I wasn't really trusting God. I wasn't acting on what the Word said. I was doing it because I had a goosebump. <laughs> I had a feeling and man, that was, I was confident in that. Feelings are fickle. Feelings come and go. When they are good, enjoy them, but don't transfer your faith over to them. Don't start saying, I know God's going to do something because I feel it. If you feel it, enjoy the feeling. But don't trust your feelings. Don't let feelings dominate you. What I'm saying right here is foreign to, I'd say, 99% of the body of Christ. The vast majority of people go 100% by how they feel. Man, you pray for them, you quote the word, you have a prophecy, you do all of these things, and they say, well, I just don't feel any different. That's not faith. Man, I'd like to say a lot of things, but you know what? I hate to drive you off in the first day. <laughs> Daniel and Carly will be a lot nicer than I am. You come back and you'll laugh with them and you'll have fun and it'll, it'll be good. But I'm telling you, just pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up, bless God. <laughs> you need to start using some faith. Well, I don't feel something. Well, who cares how you feel? <laughs> Why is feeling so important? Well, I just don't love this. I just don't feel love. Well, then you're just carnal. That's what it is because in your spirit, there's love, right. joy, and peace. Yeah. The born again part of you loves the people who hate you and the people who persecute you and the people who use your name despitefully. The born again part of you is identical to Jesus. And you have his love and stuff. And when you go, well, I know that the Lord says I'm supposed to forgive. I know the Lord says I'm supposed to love him, but I just don't feel it. Well, you're, you're saying I'm just not going to operate out of my spirit. I'm going to be carnal. You probably wouldn't say it that way, but that's exactly what you're doing. But I, I feel fear. Well, then you're carnal. There is no fear in your spirit. Are you going to walk in the spirit? who you are in Christ? Are you going to appropriate what he's done for you? Or are you just going to live like a normal, natural man or woman? I'm telling you, it's so simple. If we would cast our care over on the Lord and not let things get on the inside of us, Satan just couldn't overwhelm you. You know, I prayed with a man today over here that's been diagnosed with cancer and in the natural is supposed to die, but he's just happy. He's trusting God. They're, all of the reports are bad, but he says, I'm just fine. Amen. And he's praising God. 
And I told him there was a woman that came here to school and she was given only six months to live and they said there was nothing they could do for her so she never went back. And it's been, I don't know, <laughs> five, six years. She was given six months to live and it's five or six years and she's just healthy as a horse. And why go back? They said they couldn't do anything for her so just <laughs> keep going and she's trucking and she's doing good. Amen. I'm telling you, Satan cannot do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. And one of the things that, cooperate, that cooperates with him and enables him is fear, worry, care. You could describe this in a lot of ways, but what it is, it's not trusting God. You just aren't trusting him. He's already promised that by his stripes you were healed. If you really believe that, you wouldn't be so concerned. And we do have a part to play and it is possible that we could miss it. And God's will doesn't always come to pass, not because God's the one who fails, but because we don't appropriate it. But even if you miss it, you go to heaven. You live forever in a mansion on streets that are paved with gold. You got no reason to gripe or complain. You got no reason to be upset. If you get healed, it's awesome. Use it for a testimony. And if you die, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you got nothing to worry about. If you could get this attitude to where, man, you just praise God. You know, it's like the three Hebrew children. They commanded them to bow before the image and they wouldn't do it. And he brought them up and he says, I'll give you one more chance. You bow and I won't punish you. But if you don't bow, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. And they said, oh, king, we are not careful to answer you. In other words, we aren't afraid of you. We aren't afraid of what you're doing. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us and he will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we still aren't going to bow. They said our God can deliver us. They were believing for it. But even if it doesn't work, I'm still not going to bow. I don't care. That is awesome. Some people think, well, that was a statement of unbelief. No, that's just a statement that, you know, not everything works perfectly. We fall. We live in a fallen world. God doesn't always stop persecution against us. We're redeemed from sickness and things like that, but you aren't redeemed from persecution. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The only Christians that aren't persecuted are Christians that don't live godly. If you live godly, you will be persecuted. People will hate you. People will criticize you. So there are times that things don't work out and they were saying, we don't care if you do kill us. We still aren't going to serve you. And you know what? They happen to experience a mighty deliverance because when you put yourself in that position where you're just resting in the Lord and you're at peace, it really hinders what the devil can do. He has to have your cooperation. Satan has to have your cooperation to destroy your life. And when you're at peace and when you just say, I'm not going to let my heart be troubled. I'm going to believe in God. I'm going to trust God. And man, if I win, I win. And if I lose, I win. I can't lose for winning. Amen. You get that attitude, man, it's a powerful position to be in. When you cast your care over on the Lord, look at this passage over in 1 Peter chapter 5. The same thing is said nearly word for word in James chapter 4. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You can define, define pride in a lot of ways. Most people only define pride as thinking you're better, superior to everybody else. That is one manifestation of pride. But did you know that low self-esteem is pride? Did you know that being self-confident or you can do everything on your own, that's pride. Pride can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. And did you know that taking worry and care and trying to solve all of your problems instead of casting your care over on the Lord. That's pride. You can see that if you keep reading in context. So he said, 
God resists the proud, giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. How do you humble yourself? Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. If you haven't cast your care over on the Lord, if you're worrying about things, how is this going to play out? And you just cannot get over it. It is tormenting you. You haven't humbled yourself. You haven't cast your care over on the Lord. You're in pride. You are trying to fix this. You feel like the responsibility for this thing is upon your shoulders and you're bearing all of the responsibility. I'm telling you, there is a position of strength when you just get to where, you know, again, this is what Jamie and I did on the way in when our son had died. I just said, Father, I'm going to love you. I'm going to praise you anyway. I am not going to grieve over this. I am not going to be destroyed by this. I don't care how it works out. And when you do that, man, that puts you in a position of strength. I mean, the devil can't stand that. He can't stand it. He doesn't know how to relate to people that don't fall apart when something goes wrong. He just can't understand why is it that I just hit you with this and you are praising God and you're still happy. What's wrong with you? When you're in an MRI machine and you start writing a song... <laughs> What kind of weirdo would write a song in an MRI machine? Use the cadence of the MRI machine as a beat to go along with your song. You're stark raving mad fanatic when you do stuff like that. And he just so happened to get healed. Man, that's the way you react to things. But you know what? You can't do that if you love yourself more than you love God. But when you get to where you love God more than you love yourself, it's just like, who gives a rip? You know, I care about what's happening here. I've got a vision. God has shown me we're building this building. We're going to move into it next week. We're building the parking garage. This building is 72,000 square feet. That building is 152,000 square feet. One and a half times as big. The parking garage is one and a half times bigger than both of these buildings put together. And then I've got all kinds of other things. I've got over 150, maybe $200 million worth of stuff that God has shown me to do. And I'm heading in that direction. And I do care about it. But in another sense, I don't care. If it doesn't work, who cares? I really don't care that much. I don't stay up at night worrying about this. How many of you need $200 million? There's probably nobody else in here who needs that much money. I need, did you know that right now we need over $5 million a month just to break even? And I figured out, I forget now exactly what it was, but that's like five, $7,000 an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Since I've been preaching, I needed $5,000. <laughs> Since this service has been going, I need nearly $10,000. How many of you would, that would bother you? But you know what? I've learned to cast my care over on the Lord and I believe things are going to work out. But even if they don't work out, I don't really care. <laughs> I've already seen God do more than I ever thought he would do. And, and I, you know what? If I shoot for the stars and only hit the moon, yeah. that's, awesome. that's awesome. Amen. Amen. I'm just not worried about it. You can get to a place to where you love God. And, and you know, I honestly, mean, I've said this and people question whether I mean it, but honestly, I'm just in love with God and I don't, I don't have a five year or a 10 year goal and I'm not trying to get, oh God, please help me to get this done. I don't have anything that I want God to do. All I want to do is know God. God has told me to do these things and to the best of my ability, I'm following that. But you know, if God was to tell me your time's up, turn the ministry over to somebody else, turn over your $120 million worth of assets and just give it to them and move to a grass hut in Africa, I'd be content to do it. I'd probably be by myself. Jamie's idea of camping is not getting a suite in the hotel. 
I don't know if she'd go with me, but I'm honest. I could walk away from this. I've done what God told me to do. This isn't my baby. This is what God told me. If you haven't seen the video about the Little Star video, you ought to go watch it on our website. Gilbert Jackson saw these buildings, dedicated this property to Christian education and had a vision of this. And before I knew that, I designed it and we had this building built before I knew that this was his vision. This is what he saw. This wasn't my vision. I didn't come up with this and ask God to help me build it. God gave this vision to Gilbert Jackson and without me knowing anything about it, I fulfilled it because it was God's vision. It's not my vision. I'm not, I'm not trying to get God to do something. It's his. And if he wants me to walk away, I can walk away from it. I mean that with all of my heart. I could walk away tomorrow. I just don't care. What I care about is knowing God. I've cast my care over on the Lord. And you know what? God gives grace to people who've humbled themselves and cast their care. So I'm saying this, this applies to a lot of things, but this applies to healing. That you know, if something's going on in your body, one of the ways to deal with it is just to get to where God, I know that you've already provided it. I'm believing and receiving, but even if for some reason I don't obtain it, who cares? I'm going to go to be with you. You'll take care of whatever isn't undone and you just lose your worry about it. Worry, even medical profession will tell you that stress and worry hinders your immune system. Your body doesn't function as well when you're in fear and when you're worried about something. But when you have joy, a merry heart does good like a medicine. You would just be shocked how well things would go if you just cast your care over on the Lord and say, God, this is your problem. It's your problem. Now that doesn't mean you extract yourself because God uses us and you say, it's your problem. What do you want me to do? I'll do whatever you tell me to do, but I'm not going to stay up trying to figure out how to solve this problem. Man, that's awesome. Back in John 14, one, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe God. And then he starts talking about in my father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Why did he start talking about heaven? Because he had just told you not to worry, not to take care. How do you do that? Well, one of the ways you do it is to say, you know what? If it never works out in this life, if I never see my mate saved, if I never see the money come in, if I never see my body healed or anything, man, in heaven, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to live in a mansion. And you just start living by faith and saying, ultimately, I will win. And it helps you to put things into perspective. You know, some of you have heard me tell this story, but I go to Charlotte, North Carolina every year. I've been doing it for 33 years. This will be, September will be my last time to go after 33 years going. And anyway, I had a partner there that every time I went, he would have me come in and speak to his uh, staff. And he had about 30 people and he tells them the clock is running. You listen to this man talk as long as he wants to talk. And I would just talk to him and then go back into a back room and pray with them. And we saw people healed and born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I did that for many, many years. And anyway, one time I went there and uh, there was a woman that came back to talk to me and she had tried to kill herself the day before. She was an alcoholic. She was in her third or fourth marriage and her husband had told her he was going to divorce her. They were dirt poor. I actually went over to her house and I mean, it, you could throw a cat through the wall of the house. It was just planks up and some of them were warped and knots out and you could literally put an animal through the walls of the house. That's not an exaggeration. It was, she was a mess and she had tried to kill herself the day before. And so she came in and she was just crying and she says, I'm not a Christian like you and Chip, the owner of this business, but I know that God's real. And would you please pray with me that my husband won't divorce me? It'll be my fourth divorce. He, she said, I just can't stand it if he divorces me. That's the reason I tried to kill myself. So I told this woman, I said, now let me make sure I got this straight. I said, you aren't a Christian and you know you aren't a Christian. And she said, that's right. And I said, if you were to die right now, you would go to hell instead of heaven. And she says, that's right. 
And I said, and you want me to pray for your marriage and not pray for your salvation? And she said, that's right. And I said, lady, don't you realize after you've burned in hell for a thousand years, you aren't going to give a rip whether this marriage ever worked out or not. <laughs> Who cares about your marriage? You need to be born again. <laughs> and it's just like I slapped her. She just stopped and she looked at me and she says, you're right. <laughs> and so I prayed with her and she got born again. And then we prayed for her marriage. Amen. So I'm not saying that marriage is unimportant, but I'm saying you got to put things into perspective. <laughs> Compared to eternity, what is your marriage? And yet I can guarantee you there's people in here that you've gone through a divorce or something has happened or you're struggling in your marriage. And because of that, you just cannot let not your heart be troubled. You cannot rejoice even in the midst of tribulation. You feel justified in doing this. And you know what? Even though there are physical reasons, and I'm not saying you don't have a problem your future is so bright, you got to squint to look at it. And if things in this life are so bad that you just honestly feel like nobody knows the trouble I feel, nobody knows my sorrows. If that's the way that you feel, well then close your eyes and look at heaven and think about how awesome it's going to be in heaven and put things into perspective. That's what the apostle Paul did, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 he said in verses 16 through 18, our light affliction, which he had suffered more than anybody in here had ever suffered. And he says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So how was it that he was able to take his terrible problems and say, it's just a light affliction? It was because he put it into perspective. It's just for a moment. It's only for 30 or 40 years. <laughs> Compared to eternity, that's nothing. Amen. I know what I'm saying is just as foreign to most people and that's the reason that most people go through life stressed out and when something bad happens, you struggle and you have to run and get somebody else to help you. It's because you can't control your own emotions. You don't even think it's possible. That's not even a goal for you. You just fall apart. And then after everything is total destruction, after you've had intercourse with the devil and let sin and sorrow in, then you try and stop the birth of that sin. That's the wrong way to live. That's just as wrong as a woman who doesn't exercise control and she gets pregnant all the time, but she never wants to have a baby. That's just wrong. The way to control that isn't to just sleep around and then use abortion. It's to stop doing it. You will never have a baby if you don't conceive one. I promise you, there's only one virgin birth and it's not you, you aren't the second one. <laughs> Likewise, you'll never have the devil just destroy it if you keep your emotions under control and let not your heart be troubled. Cast your care over on the Lord and begin to start rejoicing in the Lord. In the midst of the MRI machine, write a song. <laughs> that is so amazing. <laughs> and it just so happens in less than 24 hours, he was what, pristine? Yeah. Is that what they said? <laughs> pristine health. Oh, I want that. Well, write a song in the middle of your MRI treatment. Yeah. Everybody wants the results, but nobody wants to sit there and praise God when your life is falling apart, when they're threatening to throw you into the fiery furnace. Yeah. Man, you're, you're cutting deals. You're doing all kinds of things instead of just saying that, man, it doesn't matter. Shoot your worst shot. Amen. Praise God. I tell you, brothers and sisters, God is for us. He's not against us. And if you really believe that, you could rest in that. And it just makes you different than other people. You know, I've read a number of books, Fox's Book of Martyrs and the Encyclopedia of Christian Martyrs. And I've read a lot about Christians in the early centuries up through the third century. And did you know that they, I was actually in this, uh, Rome and went to the Colosseum and then went through the catacombs and I read all of these reports of the first century Christians. 
And did you know that they would fight over who got to go out and die for their faith? They would literally fight to see who could go out first. Because the Bible said that, you know, as your days are, so shall your strength be. In other words, whatever you're going through, God will give you the grace to be able to handle it. And there is a special grace upon people who lay down their life for the Lord and they experience the presence of God so much that they would literally fight to see who got to go out and die first. There's not very many Christians today that would do that. And you know why? It's because we love our lives, but they love not their lives unto the death. And I remember when I went through the catacombs, I was 18 years old when this happened. And in the catacombs, they had to bring their dead and they would bury them in the passageways. They'd dig graves back into the side and bury them there so that the Romans wouldn't come and desecrate the bodies. And uh, they would put inscriptions over these graves. And I remember reading one inscription and a man said, here lies my wife and six month old daughter who gave their life for the glory of God in the Circus Maximus today and he gave the date. And you could just hear his pride in his wife and six month old daughter who gave their life for the Lord. And you know what? People like that they saw in less than 30 years, they saw the known Roman world evangelized. Alexandria in Egypt was over 80% Christian within 30 years of the resurrection of Jesus. They shook the Roman world. They did more to impact their world than we have done with all of our media, with our, our live streaming and all of our products and everything that we've got. You know why? Because they were so on fire for God. We actually read that Nero physically was quoted as putting his fingers in his ears as they burned Christians at the stake. They would sharpen uh, poles and run them up through a person and impale them on the pole and then set them on fire. And Nero stuck his fingers in his ears and said, why must these Christians sing? It tormented him. The Christians were singing and glorifying God as they were in excruciating pain. Stephen, when he was stoned to death, he looked up and saw Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. You know, the Bible, every time in the Bible it talks about Jesus after he ascended back to heaven, he's seated at the Father's right hand. But for the first martyr of the church, the very first person that was killed for their faith in the Lord, I believe Jesus stood in honor of Stephen and Stephen saw into heaven and saw, and because he had his eyes set on Jesus, I'm not even sure he felt all of the pain of the stones that came at him. And man, he saw the Lord high and lifted up and because of it, he was able to rejoice and say, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. All because he didn't love himself. He let not his heart be troubled. He cast his care over on the Lord things were more important to him than himself. And I tell you, this is one of the greatest things. You may not think that this is a healing sermon, but it is. Your self, your love of self is Satan's beachhead. He can't have anything against you. You know, Jesus said that the tempter has come and he has nothing in me. Satan could not do anything. They could not have killed Jesus. I don't care if they'd have crucified him a dozen times. I don't care what they'd have done. He was pure life and there was no death in him. He had to give his life. Satan had no access to him. And you know that through what Jesus has done for us, you can close the doors to the devil. You can get to where you're so uh, focused on God and thinking about him that honestly, he can't get you into fear. He can't get you into unbelief. He can't get you into depression. You're just going to rejoice and praise God all the way to the grave if that's what it takes, but you are one happy, blessed person walking in faith. And the strange thing is when you do that, you get healed yeah. because a merry heart does good like a medicine. Yeah. Believing in God is healthy, yeah. but fear and all of this stuff that we operate in, it hinders yeah. the things of God. It hinders your own body from healing itself when you're in stress. So brothers and sisters, I just am saying to you that you need to let not your heart be troubled. 
You need to get to where you cast your care over on the Lord. And if you'd do that, you'd find out that that would do more to help you get healed than a lot of things that you could do. Is just get to her, Father, I trust you. I believe in you. You know, I went golfing in, in Florida and I got sunburned real bad and I had this thing on my ear. Some of you saw it. I had it for six years and it was a cancer. Matter of fact, Dr. Bird right here on my board, he was really concerned about this and he was trying to believe with me, but he was just looking at it in the natural. And every time we'd have a board meeting, he'd say, get over here in the sun and he'd look at my ear and he'd refrain from saying things, but I could tell he didn't like it. And I had other people walk up and say, it's a melanoma and you got cancer and all of these things. And you know what? I just, I don't know. I knew that by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed and I didn't have to look at it. I can't see my ear. <laughs> I had to go out of my way to see it and I just chose not to look at it. And the thing would bleed and, and uh, it was not good. And you know what? I just didn't care. And I actually had to deal with people. Well, you could die. And I prayed for two people in one service who had their ear amputated and parts of it cut off because of the exact same thing. And I'd lay hands on them and pray for them while my ear was sitting there bleeding. And you know what? I just didn't care. And I had to confront, well, what happens if you don't get healed? Well, I get to go see Jesus. That was fine with me. There's people right here that saw me with all of that and know how it was. And you know what? I, it took six years. I'm sure it wasn't God's fault. It was my fault. Part of it's because honestly, I just didn't care that much about it. I didn't focus on it. But praise God, my ears healed today. And I didn't do anything to it. And it's healed. And I'm telling you, it works. I even had a guy come pray for me, Pastor Bobby Ray, who's a great guy and he operates in the prophetic and he said he saw hundreds of little demons like ants that were trying to get into me through my ear and they were just all over it, but they couldn't get in. The devil was trying to get at me and I, he just had no place in me. I didn't have any fear about it, any worry. I never confessed. I, every time somebody, what's wrong with your ear? I said, my ear's healed. Well, it doesn't look healed. Well, it is healed. And finally, when it was all manifest, people would come up and say, your ear's healed. And I said, I told you it was healed. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> Amen. Do you have to see it before you believe it? <laughs> Praise God. I tell you, brothers and sisters, God has given us power and ability to walk by faith that is different than walking by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. We've got access to power that we aren't using. You can operate in faith. You can believe God. You can still your emotions. If you got butterflies in your stomach, you're afraid over something, command them to fly in formation. Amen. <laughs> you don't have to deny they exist, but just tell them to get in line. Amen. You will straighten up. Amen. <laughs> I don't deny that I have negative emotions, but I do deny that those are all I've got. I've also got all of the fruit of the Spirit and I am going to operate in what God says regardless of what I feel like. You know what? I could be bothered over all of the financial stuff that I shared with you tonight, but you know what? I'm not. God's going to work it out. And you just give me a little bit of time. You hide and watch and I'll come out smelling like a rose. <laughs> Amen. It'll happen. Some of you, oh, I don't believe that. Well, then it won't work for you. <laughs> but I believe it. It's going to work for me. Yeah. Father, we thank you for these yeah. truths. Thank you for the word of God. And Father, just as Jesus was telling his disciples the night before the worst thing that anybody could ever encounter is your crucifixion, resurrection. You told them not to let their heart be troubled. Father, I speak this to my brothers and sisters in here. And right now I'm asking that you would help people to cast their care about things over on you. To quit being fearful, to quit being worried, to just let it go. <laughs> Father, we trust you. We trust you even to death. Father, we trust your word. We trust it without, without reservations. We don't trust you just to a point. We trust you completely. We trust you with our life. We trust your word, Father. 
And I believe that people tonight are able to cast their care over on the Lord right now. Father, we thank you. You know, the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. If you've been taking care, if you've been worried and fearful, you need to trust the Lord and you do it by humbling yourself and saying, Father, I'm sorry, I've, I've taken this upon myself. I'm trying to deal with this in only human natural ability. I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna turn this over to you. You know, if that's you, if God has spoken to you through this tonight, I'd like to ask you to stand right where you are and I'm gonna pray for you and we're gonna help you cast your care over on the Lord about your physical problems. We're praying for primarily about healing. It could be something else, but if you've been worried about stuff, we're just gonna let this go tonight. Thank you, Jesus. That's the vast majority of people. I think this must have been the right message. And you know, the bad thing about casting your care over on the Lord is it'll come back to you if you let it. It's not a one-time thing. You start it and you make this decision, but then you're going to have to commit to continuing to do this. And it'll be relatively easy while you're here because you're going to be sitting under the Word and hearing good things and you'll be encouraged. But when you go back home, you're going to have to make this decision that I am not going to take care for this thing. I'm going to walk free of this. I'm not going to let my heart be troubled. So, Father, right now, thank you for all the people that have responded to this. Thank you for the Word of God that has gone forth. And, Father, we believe that right now the presence of the Holy Spirit, that you just help every single person to cast their care over on the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, just in a symbolic way, I'd like you to put your hands like this and just imagine that here's your cares and you just give them to the Lord and let God take them. Just let it go. Father, I'm not taking care for this anymore. I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about how I'm gonna pay for this stuff. I'm not worried about my funeral. I'm not worried about what people are gonna say about me. I'm not worried about anything. Father, I trust you. I cast my care over on the Lord and I believe that you are solving this problem. And Father, if there's something you want me to do, if there's something I need to do, I'm all ears. As I'm here this week, Father, I'm going to listen to the Word of God. I'm going to receive instruction. I am going to do what you tell me to do. But, I, but the, the responsibility is on you. My responsibility is to respond to your ability. And Father, I cast this care over on you. I trust you. Father, I believe that you are taking care of it. I believe that I'm being healed right here in this life. And if for some reason I never saw the healing, Father, I'll experience it in eternity with you, but I am not going to worry about it anymore. Father, we give it to you, and we just thank you for taking this care. And Father, I believe that the faith of God is rising up on the inside of people, that they will act on this, and that, Father, we are going to walk out of this place carefree, walking in the joy of the Lord, writing a song in the midst of our tragedy, in the midst of our problem. Thank you, Father. Father, we praise you. Right now, just by faith, I want you to begin to praise God. It's now in His hands. You start thanking God. Father, thank you for taking this from us. Thank you, Father, that you now have all of the care. And Father, we believe that you are free to move in our life. And Satan, we believe that you no longer have any beachhead in our life. You have no landing zone. You have nothing in us. We refuse to operate in fear and worry and care and bitterness. Father, we just let it all go. And we thank you that you've taken it, that Satan has no place in us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I believe that right there, some of you are just experiencing a peace of God that passes understanding. Your situation hadn't changed yet, but in spite of what you see, there's a peace that passes understanding that is coming into your heart. Thank you, Jesus, that the love of God is flowing towards you right now and faith works by love, Galatians 5, 6. Right now, faith is beginning to rise. Peace is beginning to rise. 
Man, don't get out of peace. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Thank you, Father. Father, we labor to enter into that place of rest to where we believe you've already done it and we've cast our care upon you. We receive it. We thank you for it right now in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah.